Yeah, so we have seen, uh, uh, remove this bit here, so I can operate it here. So, so, so the report that uh, we, we are dealing with is, uh, is, is, the, uh, is dealing with the time period from 1917 to 2019, so before until the uh, normal period, uh, just before this COVID uh, era. And, uh, and here we have estimated uh, both the economic and human, human losses and, and the perspective is, uh, is, is, is global. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, the, the uh, events uh, which have uh, led to deaths and uh, you can see that it's, it's very much uh, related to developing countries uh, and, um, and, and it is, uh, we have seen drought and, and flooding events especially which has le led to uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, casualties in the worst uh, worst case and uh, and and uh, and for example this drought in Ethiopia in the in the 80s led to three three hundred thousand uh, casualties and um, and, and uh, we have also seen storm and flooding events in Bangladesh which have had uh, about the same amount of uh, casualties as uh, as has been the case in, in in Ethiopia but this is very much uh, has been very much hitting the the less developed uh, countries and, and if, you, if you look at the economic losses, uh, the, the, the picture is very, very different. And uh, so far, the most expensive uh, 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 event has been Hurricane Katrina, which was destroying large parts of uh, New Orleans. And we are just uh, interested in seeing whether this most recent uh, uh, Hurricane Idai uh, is going to exceed uh, the damage caused by, by Katrina. Uh, Quite often, these uh, these economic impacts are felt after uh, the event, and uh, that's likely to happen because we have seen major damage to the electric system in in, in Louisiana, and uh, there's there's even a chance that uh, the uh, the economic loss will be higher than with uh, Katrina. But if you if you look at this image, you can see that United States uh, is uh, is has been exposed to most expensive ones, and and and, and thereafter. There's one flooding event uh, which has been observed in in in, in China. And if you look at uh, uh, globally, these uh, these uh, first of all about the uh, amount of disasters, you can see that there's there's been an increase in the amount of uh, disasters, and uh, and the dominant ones here are flooding events and uh, storms, and uh, and and uh, and there has been a slight increase in in, in both of uh, both of them, and um, and 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 then uh, if, you, if you look at the deaths, you can see that the death toll is uh, getting down, and there's a little bit a new feature for the past uh, two decades that uh, that heat waves have become become a uh, new new thing which wasn't observed uh, in the past. Uh, this is uh, follow up two decades of, that, uh, of, that uh, heat of, waves of, have become climate change and become, become uh, a new, new thing which and, wasn't and observed down here you can see the in the past economic losses uh, this is, uh, and, and, and the trend of, is uh, of very clear we have seen more than uh, uh, tripling of the of the of the of the damage uh, during the past uh, decades and and as i said uh, this uh, this is supposed to continue and, uh, and and there the storms have been the most expensive one especially these tropical storms, uh, both typhoons and uh, hurricanes and, and cyclones, they have been the dominant one. And number two is, uh, is flooding, flooding events. And if you look at the uh, uh, distribution uh, of the hazards uh, uh, by type, uh, first, uh, uh, what, what kind of hazards we have uh, observed, uh, it's very much uh, flooding and, and drought and, um, and, and, uh, and, and storms. And uh, when, if you look at the debt, uh, Death tolls here. Uh, it's it is being caused by by drought and um, and and, and storm, storms and especially uh, tropical uh, tropical storms, and uh, and those have been also responsible for the uh, uh, flooding and, um, and and uh, and and storms have been also driving the economic uh, economic losses. And then uh, one could say that the world is not even when it comes to uh, impacts of these uh, these uh, events. Uh, the deaths uh, have been very much taking place in in less developed uh, countries, and whereas the economic losses have been highest in in developed uh, part of the part of the world. And and then uh, then about these tropical uh, cyclones. Uh, that that means. Uh, 
hurricanes, uh, uh, typhoons, and uh, and cyclones. And and here you can see again that uh, the less developed countries have been seeing uh, largest amount of uh, casualties, uh, whereas the economic losses have been highest in in United States. Uh, there's an exception of Puerto Rico, which practically belongs also to also to uh, the United States. And in Puerto Rico, for example, uh, many of the losses were observed uh, one year after the, the, the event. Uh, for example, the, the healthcare system was broken down, and, and that's why that was one of the reasons for for, for this uh, after disaster uh, losses. And finally, a couple of uh, slides from the most recent IPCC report that we published uh, four weeks ago, and, and there's an estimation how much uh, man-made uh, climate change has contributed to uh, to amount of uh, hot extremes. Uh, and uh, here you can see world map uh, in, in a little bit uh, different uh, form, but uh, this is the world map. Uh, you, you can see Americas, uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia there. And, and almost in almost the whole world, we have seen a man-made uh, increase of, uh, of heat waves. Uh, only exception is uh, southern part of uh, South, South America and from Central Africa, we don't have enough uh, enough data to to justify. But uh, that's that's a global feature. And if you look at the heavy precipitation, which leads to flooding disasters, uh, you can see that uh, very large parts of the world uh, has been has seen an increase in the in the amount of uh, flooding flooding events uh, uh, caused by heavy precipitation, and that's very much the case in Europe, uh, Asia southern part of uh, Africa and uh, and uh, some parts of uh, Americas, especially the eastern eastern parts of uh, Americas. But the, 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 there are also many places in the world we, where this hasn't been observed. And on the contrary, uh, we have seen also an increase, a man-made increase of the drought so far. And, uh, and you can see uh, uh, Mediterranean region, Western Europe, uh, Central Asia, Eastern Asia, Southern Australia, and uh, half of Africa, which has been exposed to drought uh, because of uh, of climate change, and that's also the case in in Western United States and uh, and eastern eastern part of uh, uh, South America, and 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 often these have uh, also led to forest fires, which you have been observed. And this is uh, my final slide, uh, telling what what's going to happen happen in the future. And this is an estimate uh, from IPCC report. Uh, if it would reach uh, two degrees, uh, uh, the upper limit of uh, Paris uh, Paris Agreement. So first of all, we have these uh, continents where we expect to see uh, higher temperatures and, uh, and and also more precipitation, and that's very much the case in in in, in parts of uh, Asia and and also parts of uh, of the northern part of uh, North uh, North America. And then we have uh, areas which are going to get uh, hotter and drier, and that's especially uh, the Mediterranean region, Southern Africa, Australia, and, and both uh, both uh, Americas. So this is uh, this is uh, how the future looks like, and, and this is uh, bad news when it comes to uh, amount of disasters, and also bad news when it comes to agricultural productivity of our, our planet. With these words, thanks for listening, and uh, and, and after after we have. Uh, uh, to other presentations, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Professor Tallis. Um, I'll just stop sharing the screen. Okay, and now I give the floor to um, uh, to to Ms. Mitsutori. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first applaud. WMO colleagues under the leadership of Professor Petri Tallas for producing this very timely and important report indeed. As Professor Tallas already mentioned, the good news is that more lives are being saved because of en enhanced early warning and early action. We see this um, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Bay of Bungal, uh, Bengal across the world. And uh, this is uh, thanks to advances in meteorology, satellite imagery, strong risk governance, et cetera, et cetera, and thousands and thousands of lives have been saved. But um, again, as Professor Talos mentioned, the number of affected people and the economic loss is getting um, higher and higher um, because of 
the increase in frequency uh, and intensity of extreme weather events and climate change. And we've seen this uh, this year alone uh, during um, this summer um, in the um, month of July, which was the hottest since records began. There were uh, heat waves and there were floods. So uh, we are not um, unfortunately in a safe place. And the report tells us that the 50 year trend is quite, quite alarming. Um, to give you some statistics, um, 31 million people were displaced by disasters uh, last year. Now the number of people who are displaced by disaster is almost getting larger than the number of people displaced by conflict. Uh, people pushed into poverty because of uh, uh, even before COVID-19, this was 26 million people per year. And of course, the uh, number of people who go into hunger uh, is increasing. And now with COVID and extreme weather events attacking us at the same time, uh, we live in this, what we call the multi-hazard wo world. And it demonstrates that we really need to invest more in disaster risk reduction and prevention, which is um, the mandate of my office. But um, there is one very good example where, um, which shows that prevention is, um, is uh, important. And this is the example uh, that already uh, Professor Talas mentioned about uh, Hurricane Idai. Uh, the economic loss indeed uh, will be quite uh, big, but the good news is that the uh, Hurricane Idai, which uh, in an uncanny way, is the example hit on the uh, anniversary uh, of Professor Talas mentioned Kat about Katrina. Uh, the mortality has died. been very, very uh, low. The economic and loss indeed is because uh, the city of New Orleans quite, uh, big, and but much of Louisiana. The good news is that um, the city of New Orleans, uh, in particular, Dye, which they invest uh, prevention. So, uh, what made the difference this time is that the city designed uh, a new hurricane in an uncanny and way that is damage the reduction system. The uh, investing $14.5 billion in gates, flood walls, and levees uh, that protected this once in a century storm. And I think the important thing to emphasize here is that they did not wait for another century to do this. They did it very quickly. So, three years, uh, even three years before, this was in place. And this is because the loss, major loss of uh, life, has been avoided. But I'd like to also mention here that developing countries are not so fortunate. They lack uh, resources, both financially and in terms of human resources as well. Uh, they do not have the resources to invest in disaster resilient infrastructure, multi-hazard warning systems, or uh, risk modeling. And this is the problem that we need to overcome um, because uh, these disasters affect everybody in the world, but they affect the people who are uh, living in these uh, developing countries disproportionately. The Atlas highlights that only half of the 193 WMO members have actually multi-hazard early warning systems. And there are gaps in weather and hydrological observing networks in Africa, parts of Latin America, and in the Pacific. And what we need to do now is to really enhance international cooperation because without international cooperation, this will not happen that the developing countries start investing more in prevention and disaster risk reduction. The call to G20 countries is that, of course, they need to step up in their uh, promise. Uh, they need to deliver their promise to reduce greenhouse gas emission, but I would say that's not enough. They also have to enhance international cooperation to the global south. This year, on the 13th of October, the annual International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, we are focusing on enhancing international cooperation for disaster risk reduction and prevention. And again, I would like to say that this report, again, shows us that yes, with early warning, early action, uh, lives will be saved, uh, but we need to do much more in order to make this a global phenomena. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we will take questions at the end. Uh, so I'd now like to pass the floor to Dr. Maria Nera, 
who's joining us uh, by, by Zoom. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Nehra. Uh, okay, sorry, we're just having a few technical uh, problems trying to get Dr. Nero. I think now it's okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Greetings, uh, and thank you very much for this important report. I would like to congratulate our colleagues from the World Meteorological Organization for this very important report and for giving us at the World Health Organization the opportunity to participate. For us, the cooperation, the cooperation, the collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization has been extremely important. Uh, we work on the climate change and health, and we understand very much, and everybody's understanding, thanks to this collaboration as well, the very, very close linkages between the meteorological uh, information, the meteorological situation, and how our early warning systems can contribute and align and cooperate for, for preventing more disasters. Um, let me as well uh, say that uh, this report, this important atlas, one of the key messages is once again the importance of primary prevention. And in public health, this is something that uh, we know very well. Now in the middle of this uh, terrible pandemic, we recognize that it's not only responding to the, the, the cases uh, and the, 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 the people affected and having the best uh, hospitals and uh, therapeutics to take care, but it's the importance as well to look at the causes of this type of disasters. And obviously looking at these uh, early warning systems, once again, is, is, is very much a stress and the importance of that has been highlighted by Professor Talas and as well for, from the colleague of the uh, disasters prevention. So for us, clearly the, the, the importance of saving lives, if it's true that according to this important atlas, lives could be saved because of this preparedness, the, the, the importance of the be uh, on, the, on the response and then having all the mechanisms for ensuring this preparedness and response is critical. And the, thanks to that, the mortality, the immediate mortality after the natural disaster could be reduced. It's, it's important to know as well that uh, those are the direct consequences. But if after that disaster, the agricultural capacity of that population has been uh, uh, reduced, if uh, the flooding has destroyed their shelter, that the health of the people will be very much conditioned. So the importance of early warnings, preparedness and response, the international cooperation, and the, the, the way to understand that uh, how much for our health we are dependent on uh, ecosystems, on better preparation, on agricultural production, and our dependence on access to safe food, safe water, and uh, shelter uh, is fundamental. So we will keep our collaboration with uh, all the UN agencies. And now that uh, we are preparing for reinforcing the world capacity for epidemic and pandemic preparedness and response, clearly the early warning systems related to the meteorological conditions and, and even more collaboration, uh, strengthening as well the, 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 the capacity that uh, developing countries are now uh, missing, it will be our objective. So thank you very much for the report. We are very much engaged and committed to, to keep this collaboration and stressing the importance of these early warning systems to save lives in, in future. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nera. Um, I'll now open the, uh, the floor to questions. As usual, if you could just please identify yourself uh, by your name, your media affiliation, and indicate to whom your question is, is, is directed. So I'll start with uh, Nina Larson of the French news, a news agency AFP. Oh, sorry, I think my mic is open. Christiana here. So, so we'll start with uh, Christian Ulrich of uh, the German <laughs> news agency TPA, and then we'll, I see Nina also has a hand up, so we'll go to Nina after that. Uh, 
Thank you, Claire, for taking my question. I would like uh, to ask you maybe, um, Professor uh, Talas, to zoom in a little bit on the last decade, because from the statistics here, we can see that the number of disasters has actually gone down. Is that a fluke? Because um, there was a hiatus in the rise of the medium temperature from the late 90s to 2013-14? Or um, is there a trend within this decade that shows us that in the last few years uh, things got worse? I think uh, um, Madame Mitsutori mentioned that last year 31 million people were displaced by disaster. I wonder whether you have figures that show how this has been a rising trend in the last decade. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, that's, that's a very good question. And, uh, and there are different ways to classify these uh, disasters. And uh, for example, the insurance sector, uh, uh, German uh, re reinsurance company, Munich Re is also making these estimates and, uh, and they have a lower threshold for to cl classify individual cases as, as a disaster. And in, 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 in their statistics, they have uh, shown a steady, steady increase uh, in, in the amount of disasters, both uh, flooding, uh, storms and, uh, and heat wave and drought uh, events. Uh, whereas uh, this is based on, on University of Leuven uh, uh, statistics and uh, and, and there they have uh, more uh, stringent uh, criteria for for classify, classifying individual events as, uh, as a major disaster. And, and, and these major disasters, according to their classification, has been slightly decreasing. Of course, the long-term trend, if you look at these uh, 50 years, there has, been a, there has been an increase. But uh, if, you, if you use this uh, uh, criteria of, of, of uh, reinsurance companies, uh, then uh, they have been showing a steady increase in, the, in, in those amounts. Ms. Mitsutori, do you want to say something? Yes, um, actually, um, uh, as I mentioned, the number of people who are displaced because of climate change, because of, let's say, extreme weather events, is now getting um, higher than the number of people who are uh, being displaced by uh, conflict. And this is something that has uh, been happening not only uh, since uh, last year. So um, I don't have the exact figures right now, but um, I'm happy to provide this to you uh, later on uh, through my um, office. Thank you. Um, and now we'll go to Nina Larson of the French news agency AFP. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking my question. Um, so um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, Hurricane Ida. Um, it was mentioned that uh, Ida could potentially cause more economic losses than Katrina. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate a bit on why that would be specifically. And um, I guess that would mean that the economic losses from Ida would be the highest on record. Um, is that correct? Um, and also, uh, sorry, if you could also just sort of say something about what this this storm and the difference between Ida and Katrina would, would, uh, would say, if that illustrates your point on um, how preparations have, have changed the dynamics, but I guess not when it comes to economic losses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we don't know the final costs uh, yet. We just uh, have learned that, uh, for example, the electric uh, system in Louisiana has been severely damaged, and, and that means that uh, many of these economic losses that we will we will face, uh, they are still coming. So we have we, we can say so something like in a one one month's time, what was the final final cost uh, estimate and. Uh, and, and of course, the good news uh, when it comes to I Ida is that, uh, that uh, the, the, the casualties uh, as compared to the Katrina, they were much lower. They were only a few ca casualties and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's demonstrating that uh, the uh, whole chain from early warnings to, to early action and uh, action of various authorities and evacuations uh, has been functioning much better. And also in, 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 for example, in New Orleans, they, they are now better prepared for, for, for facing uh, 
uh, this um, this uh, coastal inundation, which is uh, which is related to these kind of events. But we also know that uh, because of climate change, uh, we have now more humidity in the atmosphere, which means that uh, that uh, when it rains, it rains more, and 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 these flooding flooding events are getting worse. And uh, also, we have uh, there's some scientific evidence that these uh, systems are now moving a bit slower than than the than in the past and that's also making this uh, this uh, flooding flooding problem more severe do you like to add anything or no okay um okay so the next uh, question is uh, laurence hierro of the swiss uh, New news agency ats thank you yeah, thank you uh, for taking my question. Uh, first, so you, you just said that early warning uh, this time for EDA uh, worked better. Uh, but are there some examples since the beginning of the pandemic where restrictions linked to the cor coronavirus has led to bigger problems in terms of early warning uh, and, and evacuations of, of people? That's the first question. And secondly, you mentioned 2060 as a, as a target where if uh, mitigation measures are, are effective, it could be better. What will be the situation in 2030? Can you already anticipate with models um, either what could be the increase of, of economic losses or what could be the increase of, of uh, in, instances of, of uh, disasters? Thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. Uh, first, about this COVID uh, uh, in impact, uh, we have seen uh, uh, difficulties in, in, in uh, maintaining our observing systems. Uh, we have lost some observations, and uh, also some of the of the national med services have had difficulties in running their business as uh, as, 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 no as normally. And uh, in less developed countries. Uh, they are already having major difficulties in, in provision of good uh, good services. That's the case in about half of our member countries. And uh, and, and uh, according to our statistics, we have uh, lost observations uh, and, uh, and 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 also there have been difficulties in running the operational services, especially in less developed uh, countries. Uh, so so uh, it will be interesting to see afterwards uh, what kind of impact this is this has had. Uh, but we don't have the numbers yet, but it, we, we can clearly say that it has had a negative impact on especially less developed countries' ability to to provide uh, high-quality early warning services. And as I said, uh, this negative trend in climate will continue for the coming coming decades uh, anyhow, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there's 40% uh, there's probability that we would reach uh, 1.5 degree warming during the next uh, next decade. And, uh, and and uh, and and uh, the most recent uh, IPCC report uh, showed that there are also some some uh, changes that uh, that we will uh, see continuing for decade for centuries or even thousands of years, and that means uh, uh, melting of the glaciers uh, also here at the Alpine region, and uh, and 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 then also the melting of snow and ice cover and uh, and the sea level rise. Those will continue for at least hundreds of years and in the worst case uh, thousands of years but this negative trend in high impact weather events uh, in uh, in uh, 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 flooding events uh, storms uh, drought uh, that's something that we can we can still influence and uh, if we are successful in in reaching the paris agreement limits uh, 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 we could uh, we could stop this negative trend and and if we would be able to reach 1.5 uh, that would be best for the welfare of mankind and also also when it comes to economic losses related to disasters. But anyhow, we will see an increase of the economic losses for the coming decades and uh, and also higher impact on, on human well-being. Um, I just wanted to add to what Professor Talas mentioned that um, um, the many countries have been actually uh, suffering because of this multi-hazard uh, reality uh, since the beginning of COVID-19. There have been cyclones in India, Bangladesh, in Pacific Islands, 
there has been an earthquake in Croatia. And each and every time uh, we know that the authorities for develop, uh, disaster risk management have been uh, really uh, struggling with this challenge of coping with uh, multiple um, hazards. But uh, this means that this is the reality that we are living in. Um, and we cannot uh, uh, assume that even after uh, COVID, that the multi-hazard uh, world that we live in will change. One other thing on the economic loss is that um, definitely in absolute terms, the um, uh, developed countries are having the biggest losses. But in terms of the percentage to the GDP, the developing countries and the ones which are least developed are also suffering a lot. So it doesn't really mean that if the absolute uh, economic loss is uh, low, it, that it hasn't had an impact. It is having a lot of impact in a lot of developing countries. And this is why, again, uh, prevention, disaster risk reduction is very important. Thank you. Um, Peter Kenny. Thanks for taking my question. I uh, just wanted to get a bit of clarification about uh, the number of people displaced due to climate change. Uh, as Mr. Dory said, it's, uh, it's greater than the number of people displaced by conflicts. And uh, I also heard a figure mentioned uh, during this question time, which I actually missed during the, the press conference of 1.3 million people displaced due to natural disasters. So would the number of people displaced due to climate change be different to this 1.3 million? Uh, could I ha have some clarification on that maybe from Ms. Misituri and uh, Professor Tala, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, so the um, the data that we have currently is that last year alone, 31, 31 million people were displaced by disasters. <coughs> Excuse me. And as I mentioned, um, this is a rising trend. Um, but again, um, we are happy to provide you uh, more um, concrete figures in terms of displacement uh, from uh, disasters as uh, compared to conflict after this um, press conference through my office. I could complement uh, what may happen in the future. We have already seen, uh, 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 for example, drought uh, affecting uh, politics in the countries. We saw this Arab Spring rise uh, 10 years ago, which was, uh, which was uh, partly caused by a severe drought, which led to doubling of the food price and unemployment of the of the agricultural uh, employees. And, uh, and and we have such uh, problems, uh, uh, more or less on persistent basis in Somalia at the moment. Uh, it's Somalia is an area which is uh, which is exposed to uh, to drought. But in the future, we expect to see uh, both the population growth especially in Africa and and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and and the climate change having a combined uh, effect. Uh, if, if we are going to see 4 billion inhabitants in Africa by the end of this century, uh, together with uh, more, more severe drought events, both in northern and, uh, and southern part of uh, Africa, uh, this will for sure lead to major uh, displacement and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and crisis and, and perhaps also refugee crisis. Uh, which, which is supposed to hit uh, also areas like Europe. Okay. I'll take a couple of questions from the room now, and then we'll go back to the remote one. So Jamie Keaton of Associated Press. Good morning, and thank you. Um, question um, is is for, for both of you. Um, Professor Tallis, um, uh, this is a big study. I mean, it goes over a long period of time. There's a lot of information. Can you tell us a little bit about the difficulties of collecting information, collecting data, and are you fully convinced that this really paints the comprehensive picture, or are there some holes in the information? And for uh, Madame Mizutori, um, you mentioned the 31 million people who have been displaced. Um, how much does that part of it, you mentioned the fact that it has an impact on developing countries in particular. Um, how much of that piece is being factored into the calculations of the economic impact? In other words, when people move across borders or move uh, from their homes, what kind of impact? Is that part of the, the data or, or is that simply too hard to tell or beyond the scope of this, uh, this study? Thank you. 
So if I would start, uh, so of course, uh, we have some uh, national statistics and, and some UN statistics on, on both the casualties and uh, economic losses. But of course, this classification of uh, individual events, uh, that's, that's always uh, the challenge. So, so uh, quite often you have uh, combined uh, effects. For example, uh, when, when the heat waves have been hitting Europe, uh, for example, 2003 and uh, 2010, uh, we have seen lots of uh, casualties, and and, uh, and and those people are are quite similar people that have died because of uh, of COVID. It's it's people who have some basic diseases and uh, who are elderly. So they may die a little bit earlier because of uh, of, of heat waves, uh, and same has happened uh, with, the, with with the COVID. Uh, but again, where to where, where to draw the line? That's uh, that's not an easy case. But we have had systematic ways of. Uh, estimating both uh, casualty uh, statistics and uh, economic uh, loss uh, statistics. Thank you very much. Um, just to um, uh, complement to first uh, first question, um, so uh, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction asks member states to uh, submit data around um, disaster loss. And the first target uh, to which they submit data is mortality. And actually, uh, that is the one uh, to which the countries um, uh, submit most data because it is the one which is, let's say, uh, more easily um, gathered than economic loss or affected people. Having said that, um, as our colleague from WHO was saying, if you start thinking about indirect, uh, even loss of uh, life um, after a certain time period, uh, then it becomes more complicated because let's say in an earthquake, you can say that 1,000 people died. But even among the survivors, if people die after that because of the injuries that they sustained at that time, or even mental health issues that lead to suicide or whatnot, how do you um, calculate this? This is a rather challenging issue. And um, answering your uh, second question, so people uh, who are displaced in this case would be uh, categorized in what we call affected people, which is the second uh, global target of Sendai framework to let's reduce the number. So we don't actually, um, in the case of the Sendai framework, and I imagine, but Professor Talis, please correct me, that uh, that is not uh, included in the economic loss. Economic loss is more of the direct economic loss uh, from disasters. But again, um, your question is a very good one because um, uh, if we don't really uh, try to uh, calculate and, uh, and put in the data the indirect economic losses, the lost opportunity, even let's say a lost opportunity from loss of education and whatnot, then we're not really capturing the real um, picture of what disasters uh, do to sustainable development. Thank you. Then a question from the back of the room. Merci. Uh, Moussa Almayri TV. Je peux poser la question en français? Yeah, c'est possible, but I prefer anglais. OK. Um, I, uh, uh, about the uh, urgently recommendation, if I say that uh, to uh, to face uh, this disaster, and I have another question about Middle East. Uh, what is the situation in the Middle East, and uh, if is is similar of uh, with the rest of the uh, the world? Thank you. Yeah, one could say that. Uh, so, sorry, my my French is a bit limited. Uh, I understand it a bit, but uh, but it's. Uh, better to speak English. Uh, uh, Middle East is one of the hotspots uh, worldwide. So uh, we have two areas uh, globally which have been exposed to uh, more, more dramatic climate change than other parts of the world. Uh, Arctic is number one, and, and then Medi Mediterranean region is, uh, is number two. So we have seen, uh, for example, this summer we broke all time uh, high uh, in Europe, 48.8 degrees in, in southern southern Italy, and, and we have seen severe drought and uh, forest fires in the region, and, uh, and and also we have severe water shortages in, in middle Middle East, and uh, and and that's a, that's a source of uh, conflict conflicts and unrest, and uh, unfortunately the future scenarios for the same same region don't look very promising. It's going to be hotter and drier. 
and that's going to be negative uh, when it comes to uh, availability of uh, water, uh, but bad news for agriculture and, and also for, for tourism. It, it, it may not be very attractive for people to spend their holidays uh, once the temperature is uh, 50 degrees or even, even higher and, and uh, when it's very dry. So that's, that's, that's uh, I would say, a source of uh, unrest. Uh, uh, and it has been a source of unrest. Uh, I already mentioned this uh, Arab Spring case and, uh, and, and, and that kind of risk is uh, growing for sure. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more question, questions in the room, um, Paula, do I'm you sorry. first? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, just one follow-up and then I'll go to Paula. Okay, so please, yes. Can, you can have a follow-up and then, okay. Uh, my first question, uh, uh, it, it was about your recommendations, urgently recommendations to face this disaster. Thank you. Of course, uh, uh, of, the, of course, the key uh, priority for the man welfare of mankind is is, 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 is to mitigate the climate change. So that's that, that's essential. But uh, besides that, we have to adapt to climate change, and and uh, and, 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 um, and 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 especially the uh, richer countries have better means to adapt to climate change. Uh, but uh, but uh, for example, for Middle East, uh, we have uh, fairly rich uh, uh, Arabic countries there. Uh, and um, and and, uh, and WMO has been engaged in in in, uh, in artificial rain making uh, processes uh, to study whether that's uh, that's doable. But the, unfortunately, the results are such that uh, we don't have enough capacity to 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 to, to, to uh, make rain uh, by by injecting some chemicals in the in the clouds. But of course, uh, uh, one can use also energy to, 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 to desalinate water and, and use that for, for agricultural purposes. And that's what, uh, for example, Israel is uh, uh, fairly successfully doing, all, although we need lots of energy for that, uh, that purpose. But that's, that's an opportunity. But in, in, in general, that's going to be a challenge. And, uh, and the richer countries can protect their people by having more air conditioning and so forth and, and do this uh, desalination. And one of the challenges in the long run is going to be the sea level rise. Uh, we have uh, we, we just published the most recent IPCC report, uh, which was demonstrating that the sea level rise uh, estimates are now a bit higher than they used to be. And uh, and the bad news is that this negative trend in sea level rise will continue for hundreds of years. So so that's that's going to be also one of the one of the problems for the low, low lying countries in the region. Add, um, so um, I, I think it's in the press release too that um, there are some very um, important key lessons uh, that have been learned from this report. Um, and the first one is saying that um, um, it's not enough to look at what happened in the past, uh, that we also have to look and have more data in the future about the prob probabilistic, you know, climate change and how that is going to affect um, the occurrence of disasters. So I think that is one very good um, lesson, uh, recommendation that we have to look at both the past and the future. The second one, which is written here, which I think is very relevant too, is strengthen disaster risk financing mechanisms. Uh, this is what uh, relates to what I mentioned that uh, we need to have more financing for uh, prevention and especially in order to make that happen in the developing countries, we need more international cooperation to happen. And then um, the third thing and the most important thing I would say overall is that, and this is what the Sendai framework says, and I think it is a lesson from this, it's we just tried until very recently to react to disasters after they happen, um, respond to it and try to do humanitarian assistance. But the, the amount of money that's now needed for humanitarian assistance after a disaster has become so much that the world can cope with it. So we need to invest more money um, before disaster comes into managing the disaster risk, which will um, help um, to um, mitigate the impact of disasters. And um, Professor Tellers gave the very good example of drought um, in Middle East and other places. Drought is a typical one 
um, after a drought, uh, we um, uh, start to uh, give emergency funding to uh, the farmers or other people. We start to um, uh, distribute food. Uh, but you know, um, there's much more that we can do before the drought comes in a more proactive way, in a way that a whole of society government uh, way to uh, manage the drought risk. So um, I think you know um, those very important lessons come out from this this very important uh, report that WMO has launched. And again, I think you know um, uh, it reveals a lot on what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I could uh, still compliment uh, it was important what Mami just uh, said. Um, uh, these early warning services, they are also highly, highly important and highly good way to adapt to climate change. And, uh, and only half of our members have proper early warning services and, and uh, most of our members are not able to uh, forecast the impact of uh, weather event. And, and that's why uh, the authorities that are dealing with uh, disasters, they don't get the proper proper uh, information and, and they are not acting as, as, as needed. And, um, and, 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 and we also have major gaps in the observing systems uh, in Africa and Caribbean Pacific Islands and some parts of Latin America, which is uh, uh, having a negative impact on the quality of uh, the early warning services. So there's a need to invest uh, both in the observing systems and uh, early warning service capabilities of the countries uh, and, uh, and and also to educate the various authorities which uh, which uh, UNDRR is uh, very much uh, doing and and uh, also we have to we have started the provision of uh, services for the UN sister organizations we have lots of humanitarian agencies uh, in the UN and and once they know sometimes even a month ahead that the drought is going to hit uh, some some parts of the world uh, they can prepare their assistance uh, much better, and these high impact weather events like uh, like uh, flooding or or storms, they can be forecasted typically one week ahead. And uh, once uh, the humanitarian players and also Red Cross, which is uh, close to here, uh, they are prepared, uh, they can target their resources more wisely, and uh, and we can save uh, lives and uh, and also avoid some economic losses. Thank you. Um, we have a. <laughs> A comment in the chat on uh, um, can we send the number of climate change refugees as soon as possible? Um, we will work with UNDRR to do that. Um, the WMO annual state of the climate reports, we now incorporate figures from both the International Organization for Migration and the UN Refugee Agency on um, on displace, displacement and uh, due to due to high impact weather, but we'll we'll get you that figure, Lisa. Uh, I have two more questions, and then we do need to to wrap up just because of time. So we'll go to to Paula and then to Gabriella. So Paula, please ask your question. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, it's for the new humanitarian. Um, I uh, just wanted to know on the the last point that you actually discussed a little bit further. Um, uh, regarding the lacking um, weather monitoring capacities and and um, uh, early warning um, systems that you have in uh, those regions uh, in Africa, Pacific, and, and Latin America, I mean, is there a concern that uh, because of um, those shortfalls that we might not be then getting a full picture of uh, the future impact of um, or, or, you know, the yeah uh, of all of these disasters, uh, and um, that perhaps the situation may be even worse. Uh, is that is that a, a possibility? Thanks. Good question. Uh, uh, we can, for example, compare what happened. Uh, after uh, uh, cyclone Idai was hitting Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, Malawi two years ago, um, uh, in in uh, Mozambique they were able to forecast the the, the rainfall, uh, the, the, the coastal inundation, and uh, and high wind speeds uh, almost uh, quite okay, but uh, but they were not able to forecast the impact of those uh, of, of such an event, uh, and 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 the local authorities were not acting. As, was, as has been the case, for example, in, in, in USA, where the 
where the system is functioning in, in an optimal way and uh, they can evacuate the people and uh, they can avoid uh, many many damages by doing doing so and in 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 the case of this idai in zimbabwe and malawi they were not not at all able to forecast the, the event so it it just happened and and uh, that's sometimes the case in less developed countries and uh, the lack of uh, basic observations is having a negative impact on the quality of those early warning services we say that uh, we, we are using these forecasting models uh, and we say that if you put junk in those forecast models you will get the junk out so that's that's one of our obstacles and uh, and the wmo is very much serving as a platform to transfer the good know-how from the most developed uh, member countries to the less developed uh, ones and we are happy that uh, that some of the donor countries uh, have uh, invested money in in in, in that field uh, we have uh, for example a financing mechanism for early warning services called cruise which is a joint uh, joint one with UNDRR and uh, and world bank and and we are just preparing a new financing uh, mechanism for enhancing the amount of observations uh, especially in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific Islands, and some, some parts of Latin America. The final question, uh, Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexico. Thank you. Hey, hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, yes, I have two questions, actually. If countries like Mexico, for example, uh, we are affected by cl climate change, but also by disasters that are not related to climate change, such as air earthquakes, for example. So what do these countries need to make more serious measures, to take more serious measures uh, to face this situation? And uh, second question, uh, according to the report, the United States is one of the most affected, uh, but the previous government left the Paris Agreement uh, do you think that the attitude of the previous government also affected the perception that many people have in that country of the effects of climate change? Thank you. I could start and Mami might answer, answer this, uh, this uh, multi-hazard uh, case. So what we are very much uh, uh, promoting uh, together with UNDRR is, is, to, is to create the national multi-hazard early warning service uh, systems and centers and uh, and in the home country of uh, mami for example in japan uh, they are talking about uh, that they are a department store of all kind of disasters they are also having having earthquakes and, and tsunamis and so forth and they are able to forecast uh, the things under one umbrella the japanese meteorological agency is having uh, responsibility for all disasters and that's what we are very much promoting and in case of mexico there's, a, there's really a need to enhance the meteorological services there. Uh, many uh, similar size of countries and similar size economies uh, have much more uh, uh, advanced med services. And uh, in your case, you have fairly, uh, fairly advanced uh, hydrological institution, CONACWA, but, uh, but the med service uh, really needs uh, further, further development. And, and then about this U.S. Uh, uh, situation, uh, actually, uh, there has been progress uh, uh, in climate mitigation even under the previous administration. Uh, USA has already fulfilled uh, half of their Paris uh, pledges, and of course, the current administration is, uh, is, is trying to make a boost there. And, and, uh, and, and the President Biden has uh, uh, hosted uh, last March uh, very important uh, uh, meeting uh, where, where he was trying to uh, enhance the uh, ambition level of mitigation and, and the target was very much uh, for the coming 10 years. We have to start uh, acting uh, already during this, this decade to be successful in, in reaching the Paris, uh, Paris uh, limits. But Mami might uh, complement uh, when it comes to this multi-asset. Uh, Yes, uh, very quickly. Um, so indeed, uh, countries like Mexico and Japan, uh, which face uh, all sorts of uh, natural um, hazards, uh, 
not only the ones uh, related to climate change, but also geophysical um, hazards uh, do have to have uh, enhanced uh, plan for disaster risk reduction. The Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction calls for every country to have their national strategy for disaster risk reduction. And in this national strategy, all hazards that have historically affected a country and the future uh, probabilities need to be uh, included. And in the case of Me Mexico, as you have rightly uh, pointed out, um, there is a, a rather long list of hazards that need to be included in it. And I would in also say that countries which are affected by uh, more um, uh, different types of hazards historically and in the future, they would need to invest more in uh, the um, prevention uh, in terms of budget, but also in terms of human resources. Thank you um, very much. Uh, I think with that we will we will wrap up. Um, thank you very much indeed for participating. A uh, special thanks to um, to our two panelists and but also to to Dr. Nero who's been <laughs> very patiently uh, waiting uh, waiting uh, waiting on 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 Zoom. Uh, no questions, but obviously if you do have questions specifically on the health aspect, uh, as I said, uh, we did work very closely with both Dr. Nera WHO. Uh, and also with Public Health England. And so if you do have follow-up questions on the health, we can certainly uh, forward, uh, forward those to, to them. So thank you very much indeed, everybody. And thank you.